I was hoping to introduce Diana to you, but for some reason she's not here. I don't know why. Oh, she is. Oh, great. Okay, so do come up, guys. Um, now, we can't share microphones. We can't give you a microphone, actually. So you'll have to speak very loudly and clearly. But uh, you, many of you know Nikki. Uh, Nikki helps in the office, but she's also our new children's, children and family pastor. And uh, ably assisted this year by Diana, who is our new children's intern. And Ava May, you can come up too. Come on, Ava May. Yeah. Ava May, who was one of the first graduates at our nursery school, actually. Yeah. Do you want to say a few words, Nikki? Um, yeah, hi everyone. So loudly and slowly, I'm afraid, because we can't, we can't give her a microphone because of... Oh, but isn't someone using that already? Yeah, it's okay, it's okay. Paul's saying it's okay, it's okay. Yeah. I have gelled my hands. <laughs> um, yeah, we'd love to uh, welcome the children back to St Mary's, and I'm sure you, you're all missing their um, smiles. <laughs> so, yeah. so for the uh, third and fourth uh, Sunday of the month, we're going to be running a, um, a children's group, as we have done previously. Um, we're hoping that we'll be able to go outside most of the time for safety reasons. Um, and yeah, we're just really looking forward to, and Diana's really looking forward to getting to know um, the young people. So um, if you know any young people, um, you guys, I expect you'll be um, joining the youth. Because <laughs> you probably won't want to do paint splatting and things. <laughs> but, High expectations, um, guys. <laughs> and I think Shark and um, Sam and people are, are getting involved. I've got a new youth, haven't I? A new youth, yeah, fantastic. So, um, yeah, we're, we'll be here every second, uh, no, third or fourth Sunday, and um, yeah, we're going to be milling around, so if any questions, come and see us. So Diana's going to mill around with me a little bit at the end, and then we're going to have to race off to the church centre, as I said, do, uh, do catch us at the end and say hi. So that's the first notice. The second notice is, uh, we just don't know where it's all heading, do we? Um, and we could find ourselves in another lockdown. I don't know what they're going to be doing about worship. So um, let's just enjoy me. It's lovely to meet you together. Let's just enjoy it while we can. Um, and uh, that is definitely going to affect remembrance. I did actually see the head of the Royal British Legion yesterday on a run. Um, and at the moment, certainly from conversations with Viv and with Head Sean, um, we probably will be doing something outside. Uh, we might be able to get a hold of that paint uh, that marks grass without killing it, that sort of thing, so we can be very clear about where, where people stand. We're acutely aware, though, that whatever we do, we're going to have to do it very safely now uh, because infections are rising. So, we, you know, if we do anything at all. Um, yes, let's pray. So let's turn to our uh, service sheets. Actually, before we do, um, I know many of us were praying for Fiona, that, um, many of us paid for that lovely prayer cloth. Uh, we gave it to her last week. She was incredibly appreciative, so thank you for your prayers. Um, I'm sure that many of you will be praying, uh, I know there are many of us that we be prayed for, but we're praying for Fiona in particular at the moment because of the news that she's had. And um, if, if you're praying for her during the week, she will be having uh, some tests this week so this would be a good week to pray and I just had this verse actually for anyone who feels led and it's not everyone at all but some of us may feel led to actually say actually this week I'm going to make a special effort to pray for Fiona and for John um, and for Benjamin and Maddie their fa the family with their children uh, and if that's you I just had this lovely verse is this from Isaiah 62 I have posted watchmen on your walls, Jerusalem. They will never be silent, day or night. You who call on the Lord, give yourselves no rest and give him no rest till he establishes Jerusalem and makes her the praise of the earth. So that's an encouragement for all of us. Jesus says, isn't he? Ask and keep on asking and you will receive. He, do, he doesn't say you'll sometimes receive, he says just keep on asking and you will receive. And I don't think he was saying when he said that, I don't think he was saying we have to sort of say these slavish prayers where we repeat ourselves and we're constantly trying to 
persuade God to do something. No. Praying uh, for people in, in, in need, it's all about getting close to God, just spending time with him. Reading the Bible, perhaps listening to some nice music that helps us to reflect on, on our Father's presence. And in that place, just uh, praying confidently, however we feel the Spirit is leading us. It, we could just feel that God's praying us, calling us to pray for the family, for, for peace for them. Or we could actually feel that he's calling us to pray for healing. So there's lots of ways of doing that. But I'll just commend that, that, that to you this week. And if you want to look at those verses, they're in Isaiah 62. Let's pray. So let's turn to our service booklets and say this wonderful prayer of preparation. With our hearts open, we say to you, Father God, Almighty God, unto whom all hearts be open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love thee and word be magnified thy holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's say together our confession. God our Father, we come to you in sorrow for our sins, for turning away from you and ignoring your will for our lives. Father, forgive us, save us and help us. For behaving just as we wish without thinking of you. Father, forgive us. Save us and help us. For failing you by what we do and think and say. Father, forgive us. Save us and help us. For letting ourselves be drawn away from you, by temptations in the world around us. Father, forgive us, save us and help us. For living as if we were ashamed to belong to your Son. Father, forgive us, save us and help us. So just before I say the absolution, let's just remain in that place of, of penitence. Golly, there's so much we get wrong, isn't there? What a joy to have a God who just loves us to admit it. He loves it when we're honest enough to say, no, no, I, I get that wrong. Because he loves us. So let's just give back to our Heavenly Father all our sins and all our weaknesses. They belong to Jesus. He paid a high price for them. So the almighty and merciful Lord grant you pardon and forgiveness of all your sins. Time for a memory of life and the grace and strength of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, now we've got our collect for today, but I'm actually going to read our church's collect. <coughs> Heavenly Father, thank you for the welcome you give to all who turn to you. Grant us your love for the people of this area that we would see them through your eyes and that they would encounter you in us. May they feel welcomed into the family of this church and may we display your love and care for them. We ask this in the precious name of Jesus, our Saviour. Amen. So we're going to have our first reading. Now we've got a long reading. I'm afraid you'll understand why it's long when, when Kay starts reading it. It's a beautiful story. It's the book of Ruth. And it's very hard to cut bits out of a good story. So let's listen to this story together. The first reading is taken from the book of Ruth, the first chapter. 
In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech, and his wife's name Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Marlon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they had lived there about ten years, both Marlon and Kilion also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. When she heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, Naomi and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show kindness to you, as you have shown to your dead and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them, and they wept aloud and said to her, We will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters, it is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has gone out against me. At this they wept again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me. When Naomi realised that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them, and the women exclaimed, Can this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. If I went away full, but the Lord, sorry, I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat>
sometimes. What an amazing reading. I was asked actually in our PCC what the vision was, um, sort of, you know, rather pointedly. And I just feel that actually the vision is it really encapsulated for our church in the collect. Our church is collect, our church is prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the welcome you give to all who turn to you. Grant us your love for the people of this area, that we would see them through your eyes and they would encounter you in us. Simple, isn't it? That's the vision. That we know God, we know God's love so deeply that we become his love for those around us. And uh, we're, we're starting a new series, it's a, a series on calling. And we're going to look at the uh, whole subject of calling through two different stories. One is the story of Ruth, the other is the story of David. A sort of calling around being and a calling around doing. A calling around love, being loved and loving. And a calling around power and the power of God in this world. The power of God to transform situations in ways that we can, can never even possibly imagine. So we're starting with Ruth, we're starting with love, and um, it's, it, it's an amazing story, Ruth, it's, a, it's, very, it's quite early, some people think, some people think it's quite late, they can't really place it very well, um, but it is a very profound story. And it starts, interestingly, with the loss of someone's calling. I don't know if that's ever happened to you in life, where you've sat, sensed a real call uh, in your life, perhaps just naturally, or perhaps supernaturally, perhaps a sense of what God might want you to do, and it all seems to have run into the sand, because life has just been so incredibly difficult. And uh, the story is so artfully told. You see, uh, Ruth and Elimelech, it describes how there was famine in the land. I watched a film recently about famine. It's a, an awful, awful thing. We, we don't relate to it very well. We, many of us don't know what it's like to be really, really hungry, to go without food for a long time. And it's, it's not good. It's, it, it feels, you feel really hungry. And it hurts as well at times. And, and, and the thing with famine, so difficult is it's so drawn out and protracted it's not like someone says right you can't have food today and just stop having food no people start rationing themselves don't they? and then people start falling on falling ill it's a it's a it's a long tortuous process and it's that the period is the period of the judges as well now um if you wanted to choose any period of history i'd say i'd, I'd go for uh, sort of living through the wall, probably, than living in the time of the judges. It really was not a very nice time to be alive. It was really difficult. If you read some of those stories, particularly towards the end of the judges, it's one of the most disturbing stories in the Old Testament. And the Old Testament's got quite a number of disturbing stories, but it's there, towards the end of judges. And it's the time, so the times are not good for this man. And uh, life is not good, they're, they're facing famine. No wonder that the names of their children are um, Marlon and Killian. Do you know what that means? It means sick and ailing. They had kids with health issues. Can you imagine a more difficult existence for a young family? Uh, and what do they do? Understandably, they run off to Moab to look for food. And, and we just see that as moving country, but it, there's a lot more in that move than we understand. Because you see, God's was sort of seen as localised in those times. And, and also, if you know your Torah at all, you'll know that the first five books of the, New, of the Old Testament are the most important books. That's what, how the Jews, they're like the Gospels, really. And the first book is about how God made everything and how we got it wrong and how God's promise started with a, a small family. The second book is about uh, part of that promise to this small family being fulfilled because it's now become a great nation. But the last three books of the Pentateuch are actually about that last promise of God to his people, to give them a land to dwell in. And they never 
quite get there. We have to wait for Joshua for that story to be told. So the land was highly significant for Israelites. It meant God. It meant the worship of God. It was the good gift that God had given them. And if there was a famine in the land, what every good Israelite should do is not run off to another land and worship other gods, but to stay in the land and to pray to their God for mercy. That was what a covenant faithful Jew would do. But no, Ruth, uh, no not Ruth, but Elimelech and uh, Naomi, they decide to desert everything, understandably. And what's so interesting is Ruth, there's no sort of sense of judgment in the book, is there? You just read, this happens. But that's what every Israelite would be thinking when they read this. And life just gets so much worse. It starts badly, but it ends so much worse. Uh, Naomi's husband dies, then her two sickly and ailing children die. Having married Moabite women, without any children themselves. So Naomi has absolutely nothing. And where is her sense of calling? Where is her vision? What vision does she have? Well, what's quite interesting is how she does maintain her faith in some way. You see her when she blesses her daughters-in-law, and when she returns home to her people, that she still worships God, she still believes that there is a God. He's just not a very nice God. You know, her faith has been, uh, in some senses, constructed around her story. So God is real, yes, but he hasn't been very nice to us. God will bless you, my daughters, because he's a good God. But I actually can't trust him anymore. That's the picture of God that you see Naomi painting in her mind to those around her. For Naomi has forgotten the fundamental truth of the whole Bible. God loves her. God is faithful to her. How can she remember this God of love when life has been so hard? And she herself has forgotten her vocation to love. What does it say? Don't call me Naomi, which means sweet. Call me Mara, which means bitter. Because my whole life has become very, very bitter. Has that ever happened to us? Have we become bitter because of the difficult things, the difficult circumstances that life has thrown at us? Do we hide anger in our hearts, only to come out at embarrassing moments? Naomi has become bitter. She's forgotten how to be loved and how to love. She's what a pastor in the, uh, the States would describe as a, an unbelieving believer. <laughs> there are many of us, I'm afraid. <laughs> many, many of us. Ruth, on the other hand, is the opposite. You see, Ruth, actually, she's a Moabite woman. Now, Moabite women, just a little aside here, they weren't particularly popular to the Israelites. Okay? First of all, uh, the, the, the nation of Moab, if you look at how it was uh, formed, the story that uh, the Jews tell about the, the formation of Moab, it, it all starts when one of Lot's daughters sleeps with her father. So it's, it's not the most auspicious beginning of a nation. You know, the book of Genesis is quite hard at times, isn't it? Uh, and, and actually it was the Moabite women who led the nation of Israel astray in the wilderness around Numbers 25. And it was the Moabites who hired Balaam to curse the Israelites. So the Moabite women were sort of seen as these loose women who lead the good uh, Jewish men astray to worship other gods. And Marlon and Kilion had married two of them. 
And, and yet Ruth, she's a little bit like that prostitute that Jesus talks about at the feast of Simon the Pharisee, isn't she? Simon, you love little because you've been forgiven little. But this prostitute, she loves much because she's been forgiven much. And golly, Ruth has this amazing capacity to love. I mean, when she says to Naomi, I'm, I'm sticking with you, she's leaving all her security behind. She's leaving all the people she knows behind. And she's leaving her religion, her way of worship, her way of seeing the world behind. She's leaving everything because she wants to look after her mother-in-law. She loves much. She loves greatly. And what's so interesting is how close Ruth comes, because uh, uh, sort of a good Jewish rabbi would at this point be thinking of one of the great patriarchs of the faith, Abraham. You see, Abraham did just the same thing. He left his kinfolk. He left all the people he knew. He left his security. And he left his religion to go looking for this God who he didn't really know. And Ruth, this Moabite woman, exemplifies the faith of the father of faith, the father of all our faith, Abraham. She loves much. And because of that capacity to love, it's almost as if God is going to meet with her. You know, your God will be my God. She doesn't know what she's saying when she says that. But God does. It's almost as if God, through Naomi, has been calling her back to him. Ruth, if you like, is a believing unbeliever. She doesn't have any faith at all, but she just loves well. And God can, is quite capable of finding us when we're good at loving each other. But how about Naomi? Well, there's good news here as well. You see, um, I, I don't think, and, and uh, people can disagree with me on this if they want to, but uh, it's, a, it's, a line of, it's, it's a line that some scholars take, and I, I sort of tend to take this line myself, which is that I, I actually don't think that Naomi wanted Ruth to come back with her. It's quite interesting how the, the last few verses of this text, they stress the fact that Ruth is from Moab, and, and it repeats the Moabite test. It sort of repeats it two times. And it's almost as if the text is highlighting the fact that Naomi's come back with this Moabite woman. You see, it's pretty hard for Naomi to come back to all those people who she's grown up with for the whole of her life, uh, knowing uh, the news that she has to tell them. The news is that she deserted the country and that she's lived under the, God, the curse of the Lord. Because her husband's died, her children have died, and she has no progeny. So the three things that were central to Jewish matriarchs, she's lost it all. Her life has become bitter. The, the last thing she really wants to, to drag behind her, having to explain all this to the people she's grown up with, is a representation of how unfaithful her, their family had been. This, frankly, embarrassing Moabite woman. I don't know if you've read The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. I, I studied it for A-level, and there's a particularly uh, uh, very sort of visually strong bit of it. It's quite a visually strong poem. Uh, but there's a very, very visual sort of uh, bit where he has to wear an albatross around his neck, doesn't he? Ruth is known as albatross. And she's going to be wearing that for the rest of her life, and she knows it. But what she doesn't know is that Ruth is going to be her salvation. There's a word to describe how God is acting in this instance. It's a Jewish word, it's, it's chesed. And it means God's faithfulness to his promises, his loving kindness, his understanding of how wrong we can get it. The, the, the closest translation to that will probably be grace in the New Testament. And we're going to see just how gracious God can be in the middle of a situation uh, 
when Naomi uh, is going back with someone she doesn't want to, she's going to find that God is actually that. This, this Moabite woman is actually her family's salvation. I'll never forget taking a funeral. It was a really difficult funeral. A lovely man called Alistair Keith. And Alistair was uh, one of those uh, believing unbelievers. His wife had tried to drag him to church for the whole of his life. <coughs> he died quite young. It was very sad, actually. And uh, it, there was such a sense of anger in the room at his death. Uh, so many angry people. Angry with God, probably. And it was uh, lovely, actually, to be able to tell the story of Alistair's conversion in that place. You see, Alistair did love well. There was a, uh, a few months before there had been a, a, a man, he didn't know him, he, was, he just saw this guy floundering in the, on the beach in Cornwall. And uh, actually the reason why this man was floundering was he could hardly see a thing. He had 5% vision because he had lost it uh, from a brain tumour a few years before. And Alistair went up to help him because he was a, a generous Lovely man, actually. But what he didn't really know was that that was God reaching out to Alistair. Because Alistair didn't know that he actually also had a brain tumour. And he was diagnosed uh, dramatically a few weeks later. But of course, he had by that time become friends with this lovely man whose name is James Shaw, and he comes to speak at this church. And they're, they're, in their friendship, uh, Alistair was able to reach out to James. He has a very, very strong faith. And in turn, was able to reach out to us. And we were able to look after him in his last few months, weeks and months. And pray for him a lot. And, you know, we had a lovely time to pray with, with Alistair. And Alistair found faith as an unbeliever. Because his heart was open to those around. Do we know that God loves us? Do you know that God loves you? I remember a member of, the, uh, of our church is saying, oh, you know, I know God loves me. Well, quite frankly, if, if we knew how much God loved us, we'd be like him. We'd never doubt him ever again. We'd never worry, we'd never fret, we'd never get angry, because he loves us just so, so much. And you know, when you know that love, loving others becomes very, very easy. Just like breathing. Let's pray. <coughs> Father God, thank you for your story, for this story. Father, we want to be people who love well and who love much. But we recognise that we don't know how well and how much we are loved. So I just want to invite the Holy Spirit to come right now. And as we reflect on you in this service, as we pray, draw close to us. As we come and receive your body and your blood shed for us, broken for us, draw close to us. Show us how much and how well you love us. And help us to love each other the same way that you do. In Jesus' name, Amen. Let's stand and uh, say the creed together. Do you believe and trust in God the Father, source of all being and life, the one for whom we exist? We believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Son who took our human nature, died for us and rose again? We believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Holy Spirit who gives life to the people of God and makes Christ known in the world? We believe and trust in him. This is the faith of the church. This is our faith. We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's Sister Neil to pray.
prayers today were especially praying, Father God, for our nation and for the world. Praying for your grace over our nation in the face of the pandemic. Praying for your mercy over the world in the face of all that we're doing to destroy it as this amazing present you've given us. Bring peace, Lord, and your Holy Spirit. church, Lord, we thank you for this enormous vision, actually, to love, to love each other, to love those outside of us. It's quite an inconvenient thing to do some of the time, Father, and it can be difficult. And we just recognise today, Father, that we need more of your love. We need more of you in our lives. So we come to you with all our hurts, with all our wounds, with all our worries, with all our cares. We open our hearts to your presence today. And we ask that you will fill your church in this nation so full with your love that we will love Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father God, we do finally pray for those who are unwell amongst us. And I'm just going to leave a short space where we can mention any, any by name. also heard the names of those uh, of us who just didn't feel we could say them out loud. You hear all the names. You are concerned for those we love. Uh, we pray for each one of them. We pray for uh, the Boyd family this week, for Fiona, and for the many others on our prayer list. We invite your presence close to them. Draw close to each one of those people. And we also want to invite your healing. Lord, we command your healing over their bodies, over their hearts. We contend for your healing, Father God. In Jesus' name. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let's finally say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of thy tender mercy didst give thine only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made there by his one oblation of himself once offered a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice, oblation, and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world and did institute, and in his holy gospel command us to continue a perpetual memory about his precious death, until his coming again. Hear us, O merciful Father, we most humbly beseech thee, and grant that we receiving these thy creatures of bread and wine, according to thy Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood, who in the same night that he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup. And he gave it to them, saying this, Drink ye all of this, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for the many, for the remission of sins. Do this as often as ye shall drink it, in remembrance of me. Amen.
let's receive the love of our Father in heaven for us today. Let's know when we go back into our lives that He loves us, that He is with us, that we have nothing to fear. Whatever homes we're going back to, whatever problems are there, love will go with you today. Receive the love of God in your hearts afresh. Know his love for you. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. And may the blessing of God who is our Father, who is the Son, and who is the Holy Spirit, rest on each one of you and all those whom you love this day and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, we will. Salvation. God bless you.